core concept of the masochism in Venus and Furs is that a man places himself entirely at the disposal of a beautiful woman with the request that she treat him as badly as she can conceive. That is the core concept of Venus and Furs. What is interesting, amongst many other things about this book, at least for me, is that it causes, at least it caused me, to view a whole host of other things in a slightly different light. And part of it is that uh, Leopold von Sacher-Masek gives a handful of examples of stories that he thinks have masochistic elements in them. The Odyssey, The Book of Judith, Samson and Delilah. Now, the, these things he cites. And in The Odyssey, he's talking about Circe, who is a, a sorceress who turns her suitors into animals. He considers this to be a masochistic story that delighted him, the idea of being turned into an animal by the object of your affection. And once he made that list, a whole host of other examples popped into my head. But the one I want to focus on to start this is Charles Dickens's Great Expectations. This is actually a masochistic tale. Pip in Great Expectations is a masochistic character. Now, as you know, I am sure, the core of that story is that he is mistaken in his belief that it is Havisham who has made him into a gentleman after prompting her ward, Estella, to treat Pip as badly as possible. And this is important. This is important because this is central to the masochistic concept. To believe that you have been elevated by the very woman who has degraded you is the essence of masochism. Which is to say, of course, that the fantasy is not quite what it seems. The victim is tortured, but in the interaction of torture, it makes the victim worthy of a superior torturer. Deliberate cruelty being an action seldom undertaken out of indifference. But in looking at Great Expectations, consider how pitifully stupid Pip is. He prefers the delusion that he is the beneficiary of a sadistic woman than to suspect or to discover for himself that it was actually his own kindness that would make him a gentleman. And a scarce kindness it was for Tamagwitch, a man for whom the world had provided nothing but hard luck, starvation, chains, and indentured servitude, Pip represented the one charitable soul he ever encountered in his entire life. The masochistic Pip prefers to think he is the recipient of scraps from the table of Venus than to believe he is receiving the grateful recompense from a good deed. Okay, now let's get to Venus and Furs, and let's get to how the actual story starts out. The setting in which Severin meets Wanda. Severin is the main character. Wanda is the, is the Venus. These are, these are the opening lines of that part of the story. The days drift aimlessly by in the little Carpathian health resort. I see nobody, and nobody sees me. It is so dull here that one might take to writing idols. All right, so it already starts in idleness. A and Sacramasic does this on purpose. That it is when we are idle that we are apt to err, right? That when we're doing nothing, that that's a problem. The guy's bored. If you wanted to make a joke about it, you can say the guy is so bored. He's like, oh, man, I got nothing to do. I wish someone would just come <laughs> whip me to relieve the boredom. <laughs> so, but that's how it starts. And in this, it has its parallel in Goethe's Werther because that's how Werther starts too. Just like this guy. He's something of an amateur uh, painter, and he's off in the countryside trying to find inspiration. It is in this setting that Werther will meet Lottie, who is the source of so much of his misery. Environment of sloth. And an artist unites Werther and Severn. Consider this warning. This is from Satan in John Milton's Paradise Lost, Book 6, starting line 165. This is what Satan says to the armies of God. Now remember, in Paradise Lost, Satan can be many times the voice of reason. He, is, he mixes reason with his folly. So these are the lines, starting 165. But now I see that most through sloth had rather serve, ministering spirits trained up in feast and song. Spirits trained up in idleness and artistry have been trained up for service. And consider these lines from the David Lane movie, Ryan's Daughter, which was based on Gustave Flaubert's Madame Bovary on having nothing to do. So, what do you do, Rose, mooning about all day by yourself? Me? Well, I'm 
wasn't really reading it. You're doing nothing, then? I suppose so. Have you nothing to do? Precisely that. Well, Miss Precisely, that's a pity. Doing nothing's a dangerous occupation. So it is in this idle setting that they meet. And the way that it comes about is that Wanda sends her maidservant to ask him if he has any books that he might lend to her. And indeed he does. But he accidentally leaves a card in there that has the Titian painting of the Venus with a mirror. And on the back of that, he's written his notes about it. So she gets some inkling uh, by accident of what his state of mind is and how he is a romantic and how he views the world. And then he bumps, he bumps into her. So what she says to him is this. She considers his views modern, her views ancient. She distinguishes herself from him. It would seem, she began, that for you, love and particularly women are hostile forces. You try to defend yourself against them. However, you are quite overcome by the pleasurable torments and exquisite pain which they afford you. A very modern view, she writes. She says to him, here's what she says, I admire the serene sensuality of the Greeks. Pleasure without pain, it is the ideal I strive to realize. She does something interesting next. Rather than cite an actual classical writer, an actual Greek, she turns to Goethe. These lines from Goethe's Roman elegies have always delighted me. The love we find in nature is the love of heroic times. When the gods and goddesses did love, in those days desire would follow upon look, enjoyment on desire all else was an affectation a lie let's pause right there those words are good enough those words are fine enough in and of themselves does she live by them she's not attract she's not coming to him on a look is she she's coming to him because she saw his notes she saw his mind all affectation indeed wanda is it a lie the quote continues we prefer a pale thin virgin of holbein who belongs to us alone to an antique Venus, no matter how divine her beauty, who today loves Anchises, tomorrow Paris, and the day after Adonis. Nature admits of no stability in the relations between man and woman. I wish to live as I please. I shall deny myself nothing. I shall love everyone who attracts me and give happiness to everyone I love and virtuously turn away from the poor man who burns with passion for me. Just so we understand this, she thinks her view is that a woman should be able to do as she pleases. She thinks his is not this view, that he reflects the modern view. Do we understand how this paradoxically affects what is to follow? He simply asks her to live the very life she claims she wants to live, to move from one man to another upon a look. So here's what she goes on to say about, about modern women. <laughs> this is good enough. And she'll go on to say something about modern men. These poor hysterical creatures who pursue like sleepwalkers the dream of an ideal man while failing to appreciate the best of men. They deceive and are deceived. They are never happy and cannot give happiness. That last line, they are never happy and cannot give happiness. This is a very important line. This this indicates that the, so, the real source of, of masochism is coming to the conclusion that women are not to be trusted with the provision of happiness and pleasure. They can't do it. They can't effectuate it. So in saying inflict pain instead is in essence the masochist communicating to the woman, you're better suited to the inflicting of pain. There is a task I can entrust you with. But consider that in juxtaposition with what she has just said. She had said, I admire the serene sensuality of the Greeks' pleasure without pain. It is the ideal I strive to realize. That she begins to feel affections for him. As if, and I want to show the way this paragraph appears by itself on the page. I'm going to put this whole thing up. This is it. He puts this down unadorned, doesn't try to explain it, as though he's unwilling or too scared to comment upon the veracity of her affectionate words. You interest me. Most men are so common, so lacking in verve and poetry, but there is a depth in you, an enthusiasm, and above all, a serious mindedness that warm my heart. I could become attached to you, she says. She's told him she likes pleasure with no pain. Now she's telling him she could become attached to him. 
And how is he going to reward this? This is what he says later. There are two kinds of women that I can love. If I cannot find a noble and spirited woman willing to share my destiny in complete faithfulness, then give me no half measures, no lukewarm compromises. I prefer to be at the mercy of a woman without virtue, fidelity, or pity. For she is also my ideal in her magnificent selfishness. I cannot enjoy to the full love's perfect bliss. Then let me empty to the dregs its cup of bitterness and woe. Let me be ill-treated by the woman I love, and the more cruelly, the better. If you've ever had a conversation with a woman, it's very common for a woman to hear the insult in what you have said. And listen to what he has said. If I cannot find a noble and spirited woman willing to share my destiny. He is saying to her, a woman who has told him that she likes him, that her acquaintance has not caused him to veer from this contingency plan to abandon his hopes of meeting a noble and spirited faithful woman. She's just said to him, she could become attached to him. How could she not take this as an insult? I'd rather have you indulge in your magnificent selfishness? Really? What girl wants to hear you say that? Go say that to a girl. Excuse me, madam. I'm looking for a woman without virtue, fidelity, or pity. What he has essentially told her is, you're the hooker I've been looking for. Do you know what she says to him in response? Are you aware of what you're saying? Now, of course, that line can be interpreted two ways. The obvious way to interpret it is that she's asking him if he understands the ramifications of being a slave. But I think it could just as easily, being her, incredulous to what he has just said out loud to her. But I think something else is interesting. I don't buy her. Her stated view that she thinks she should be able to just drift from man to man in two to three month cycles, one to the next, for the foreseeable future, and that if only society were more like ancient Greece, then anyone who encountered her would call that lifestyle appropriate for the goddess she resembles. It's such crap. She doesn't believe it, and I think she knows full well there has never been an age in history where frivolity has been a virtue. And I think it's just part of life that sometimes the lifestyle that we approve of, in principle, is not the life we actually seek. And further still, that many who proclaim their promiscuity with the strident ardor that implies that their life principles have met with great resistance, do not actually seek approbation for their, for their past. She seeks immunity from it. It is a rare woman actually wants to be commended for her promiscuity. I say this because I find this Wanda to be an impossible character. And I think one of the reasons I say that is because I'm from Massachusetts. So for anyone who's listening who's not from America or from Massachusetts, you have to realize it may be different where you live. But the idea of a beautiful woman saying that Friedrich Schiller is one of her favorite writers within minutes of meeting you is a ridiculous notion to me. Schiller or any writer of import along those lines and being prepared to prove in conversation that she has read them absolutely um, beyond any kind of connection I can make with where I live and who I meet. And what happens next, and the reason why I want to say this is because it touches upon her impossibility as a character, not just in what she knows, in what she's about to do. She becomes a fulfiller of fantasies. What comes after this conversation, he does indeed become her slave. He goes with her to a store and she buys the biggest whip that they have, a whip that's meant for a dog. And he does follow her around and they form a contract and things escalate and she whips him, she mistreats him. But once we see past the whips and service, this woman goes through great lengths to make his dreams come true. So yes, he's the, he's the masochistic victim, but she is indeed a fulfiller of fantasies a Venus bending over backwards to please this person. Who is the real tyrant in this story? And there, we're going to start to talk about moments where we begin to feel very bad for her. One of these is following one of the whippings. So here's the line. She calls me from her balcony. I race upstairs and find her standing on the doorstep, holding out a friendly hand. I am so ashamed, she says. I put my arms around her and she rests her head on my shoulder. Why? Try to forget yesterday's horrible scene, she says, in a trembling voice. For your sake I satisfied these mad wishes. Now let us be reasonable. We shall be happy and love each other. And in a year's time, I shall be your wife. Not another word about slavery. She has just expressed a wish that he will not grant. 
Now, much like the section I had read before, where she said she could become attached to him, Leopold von Sacker Masick leaves her comments with no commentary of his own. Isn't that interesting? He does this yet again. This scene breaks off without him telling us how it makes him feel when she says she loves him. Now, this next scene might be even more significant. There's a moment where he, like a slave, is being forced to walk behind her like a servant as she's talking with some of her friends. But there's a moment where she breaks with these friends and waits for him to catch up to her. And the gist of what she says to him is that she's, she seems to have grown, grown weary with her friends. She prefers his company. She'd rather talk to him. She's uninterested in frivolous, stupid conversation. She likes him. She wants to spend time with him. God forbid. And his response to her is, don't let me get in the way of your, of, what, of your desires and wishes. Don't let me get in the way of you going to Paris. She's just told him what she's not interested in. And his response to her is, go do it. That's a mean thing to say to someone who's in love with you. It's a mean thing to say when someone says, I'd rather spend time with you than do this. And your response is, do that. And I think that's kind of an underlying part of this, that people with low self-esteem have a false sense of their ability to do great psychological harm to somebody. They don't value themselves, so they can't conceive of the fact that their words and deeds matter to someone. So there are a few things about this that are not quite what they seem. First of all, it might look like he has forfeited a great deal. He is actually the person who has defined the parameters of their relationship and is unwilling to change it. She can't be anything other than his master. The other thing he has done is under the terms, it looks like he's a slave. It looks like he has sacrificed something. But along with his, his, his sacrifice of his own power and his equality in the relationship, he's also forfeited his responsibilities to her. He doesn't have to do them. What does he have to do? Every now and then, what, he reads to her? He, he is not a source of, 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 of emotional support at all let alone financial support. She's paying for everything. We feel bad for her. We feel bad for it many times throughout this story. Let's get on to the humor. And I said in the last one, we're going to start doing Simpsons clips. There's just not a single literary concept that they haven't covered. Masochism? Of course they got it. Bart's girlfriend, let's watch. The great thing about Sunday school is we're finally learning something we can use. Yeah, so true. I have to turn my chair this way now. Bad, and I like it. I'm bad to the bone, honey. Let's go find some fun. But your father said... Oh, I told the Rev. I was going to my room to say my prayers. Smart, beautiful, and a liar. Jessica, you're really beautiful, but you are not very nice. <laughs> Duh. I learned that I can make men do whatever I want. Well, don't you see, Jessica, then you really haven't learned... Um, would you finish scrubbing these steps for me? Will I? Hey, Jessica. Coming. Poor sucker. It's amazing what some guys will do for a pretty face. Okay, so I think our friend Leopold uh, von Sacker Masik is not blind to the potential humor of masochism. If we take this one scene here, there's a scene in which he prostrates himself in front of his Venus, and he's screaming things. So be it. Be a tyrant. Be a despot, but be mine, mine forever. And we can imagine the picture he must present with his arms around her knees. What she says is, this will end badly, my friend, she said severely and without the least emotion. I think that's a funny scene. That's a funny spectacle. And I think he's aware of the ignoble vision he must present. He knows he's a little bit of, of an object of ridicule. This is well after he becomes her slave and he's he's got to follow her around and he always sleeps in worse accommodations than she sleeps. So here's one. Meanwhile, I thank heaven for being able to at least eat undisturbed. I then climb the four flights of stairs to my room. My small traveling case is already there and a dirty oil lamp lights the room, which is tiny, has no fireplace and only a narrow vent for a window. If it were not so dreadfully cold, it would remind me of the Piambi of Venice. I burst out laughing in spite of myself. Self. And the echo of my laugh startles me. What? A, who is this wimp? He's a he's a funny person. He's presenting himself as an object of ridicule for us. 
Another line later on. Here's what he writes. At last, a day without guests. Wanda sits on the balcony reading and appears to have no orders to give me. As the silvery mist of evening retreats and twilight falls, she dines and I wait on her. Although she is eating alone, she has not a glance, not a word for me, not even a slap in the face. <laughs> he's complaining that he's not getting slapped. It's a little funny. So that so that's the humor. The next thing I want to do now is deal with his literary and artistic references, uh, namely the Titian painting, Goethe's Faust, and Mannion Lesko. Faust we can dispense with quickly. It's not a masochistic story at all. And you're just going to have to read that for yourself. How about Mannion Lesko? Mannion Lesko has more in common with Emma Bovary than she does with Wanda von Dunajew. She's pretty frivolous. The, the pleasures of the world are insufficient for Manon Lesko without their materialistic accoutrements that she enjoys. Luxury. Now, that makes her a difficult comparison with Wanda because Wanda already has it. She's independently wealthy. But more importantly, is the Chevalier de Grieu in Manon Lescaut a masochist like Severin? Well, if he is, it's a process for him to get there because he says this. This is right about the middle of the story when he's being visited in prison and he's being chastised for his ways by his good friend. These are the words of the Chevalier de Grieu. Would you argue, like the mystics, that what torments the body delights the soul? You wouldn't dare. It's an untenable paradox. So... While later on there is language of submission, it's not this instant conversion that uh, Severn experiences. And when the couple eventually reaches Louisiana in that story, they live like equals. And just about the last thing I want to get to is his take on the martyrs. The idea that the martyrs of Christianity were super sensualists who enjoyed the idea of being tortured and killed. Whether or not he's right about this seems very difficult to prove. But what is interesting is to wonder whether or not other artists share this view. People like Bernini and Caravaggio, or the general fascination with martyrdom in the arts. Interesting. Interesting to think like this. As far as the Titian is concerned, I looked into it. That's going to need its own video. But as far as Leopold von Sacher Masek thinks, what the Titian painting represents, the woman must shield her natural pagan nakedness from the metaphorical chill of post-Christian northern prudism but in some of the last lines it all circles back to the problem of idleness against work these are some of his last not lines after after the whole experience is over i don't want to give it away so i simply returned home and for two years shared his his that's his father's worries administered our estate and also learned something which was quite new to me and which now refreshed me like a draft of clear water to work and to fulfill my duties